Okay, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Roger Waldinger. I'm professor of sociology at UCLA and director of, of the Center for Comparative Immigration Studies. And I am delighted to welcome you to today's event, which is uh, co-sponsored with our friends and colleagues at the Center for Comparative Immigration Studies at UC San Diego. Before I uh, introduce uh, today's speaker, I just want to say a little bit uh, a few words about what's going to follow during the rest of the academic year. We're going to, today's the last day of the quarter at UCLA and UCSD. So we're going to take a two week break and then we will begin again in spring. And we have uh, five, uh, actually six uh, uh, co-sponsored events that are planned for uh, spring quarter uh, with uh, the first uh, to take place. Uh, sorry, I have to check my calendar. Um, the second Friday in April, that'll be, um, sorry, April 8th, uh, and with a, a, a session on a new book by uh, Hiba Goayed called Refuge, uh, How the uh, State uh, Shapes Human Potential. Uh, and, uh, and then we will have a, four other talks and then a, and then, uh, a sixth event uh, on refugees and the war in Ukraine uh, to take place in late April. And then uh, UCLA, CS, uh, UCLA CSIM will have a separate uh, event on uh, April 1st with uh, Professor Oscar Gil Garcia, who will talk about legacies of forced migration and photographic testimony of indigenous Maya in the Americas. So without further do I'd like to uh, begin today's uh, event, which is a, a book uh, presentation by a Professor Pi Hang Su talking about her recent uh, book, new, just released book, The Border Within, Vietnamese Migrants Transforming Ethnic Nationalism in Berlin, to be followed by a comment by Professor Irene Blomad of the UC Berkeley Sociology Department. So as usual, we'll give uh, 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 Professor Su roughly uh, 30 minutes or, uh, to present her uh, book followed by comment from Irene, a response from Fee, and then we'll open up the discussion to the rest of the audience. If you could uh, either ra use the raise hands function or send me a question in the chat, that would by be ideal. So without any further ado, Fee, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Roger. Let me just share screen now and I can get started. I also just need to make sure Yes, it's gonna share computer sound. Okay, great. Thank you so much to you and David for the invitation to share this book with everyone here today. And I'd also just really like to thank Irene for serving as discussant in the middle of all of the things that you have going on right now. I'm looking forward to the conversation. And I'd like to thank Warren for making this virtual event possible as well as to the co-sponsors that I see Gail here from the UCLA Center for European and Russian Studies. So that center, as well as CSIM, were two of my intellectual homes at UCLA, where I developed and carried out the research that forms the basis of this book. So I'm just really grateful for this special way to introduce the book into the world. Before I jump into the talk, I wanted to share a one minute clip with you just to preview the book. And I think it'll help with a lot of the historical details and the timelines that not everyone on the call might be familiar with. So, I'm just gonna start it for one second and I'll check and see if you can hear it and then I'll play the rest. Can everyone hear okay? Okay, awesome. So I will continue. At 21, Thai lost his homeland. After South Vietnam fell in 1975, Thai escaped and resettled in West Berlin. As Thai lost a homeland, Jin gained a fuller one. Born in North Vietnam, she went to work in the Eastern Bloc at 18. Just months after Thai and Jin arrived in Europe, the Berlin Wall fell. The 90s were a time of massive upheaval, but also of ethnic solidarity. Yet, by the time I arrived in Berlin, people warned me that there were two Vietnamese communities there, embodied by Jin and Thai, North and South, and they didn't get along. So how did we get here? I invite you to follow along with Thai, Jin, and others like them as they rebuild their lives after war and border crossings. Along the way, they teach us to rethink the nation and our role in it. Take a look. Thanks for letting me share that. So as I mentioned in the trailer, I first came to Berlin in 2013 
wanting to understand how Vietnamese migrants rebuild their lives after war and border crossings. And I was interested in something more specific than that, which is how do people relate to politics and particularly to the politics of communism and anti-communism? So I'd been studying this ethnographically in Southern California with several of the folks on the call right now, but it seemed to me that the US was something of a really special case. So mass migration out of Vietnam to the US began in the context of the Cold War. And since I was interested in how people learn politics across the life course, it seems like it would be hard to tease it out in this case because people leaving Vietnam after 1975 might have carried anti-communist politics with them. They might also have learned those politics in the US in a context that was still very much shaped by the Red Scare. So I wondered about places where Vietnamese border crossers were not primarily refugees. So rather serendipitously, I was using the Deutsche Welle free tool to practice German and I stumbled across, oops, sorry, stumbled across this article by Sebastian Schubert called Berlin's Vietnamese Wall, talking about these different migration streams to Germany, and then it reunified and they encountered one another. So here was this neat historical situation in which people from the same country that was divided and then reunified, then migrated in two parallel streams to another country that divided and would later reunify. But importantly, it was also a country that had had a strong leftist movement. So in summer 2013, I touched down in Berlin. I started visiting restaurants, community centers, and other cultural spaces, just trying to see if I could make this a viable field site and if other if folks would talk to me. But of course, ethnography works best when you're open to being surprised. Even when you're not, I think it finds ways to surprise you. So by the time that I got to Berlin, shortly thereafter, the piece about explicit politics soon dropped out. I'm happy to go into reasons for this in the Q&A, but in short, a lot of folks across region, regional backgrounds and migration backgrounds shared really similar attitudes toward politics, political parties, democracy, communism, and the state of Vietnam. But as I talk about in the trailer, I would introduce myself to folks as a student who was just interested in understanding the lives of Vietnamese people and almost all the time, the response was, well, first you have to understand that there's not one, but two Vietnamese communities here, and they don't get along. Several people also told me this regretfully. So one of the folks who did was a woman I call Lan, and I was staying over at her apartment one weekend. We were talking late into the early hours of the morning, watching films that showed scenes from Vietnam, and she was in a wistful mood because she had never returned after leaving. And she said, I look at Germans and I feel like they're so lucky. Why were they able to heal like that when we haven't? I wanna be clear that Germans don't necessarily feel that they've healed after reunification, but I still heard this sentiment enough times from enough different folks that it made me wonder about this yearning for reunification, for reconciliation, about the belief implied in this, that there was some category that needed to be made whole. So why did these people see themselves as a nation that was divided after the states and the borders that enforced this division have disappeared? Or put differently, why do homeland divisions persist long after the geopolitical events that created them have changed? So this question undergirds the book, which centers on how border crossers thousands of miles away from the place many of them still call home, make sense of their social, cultural, and religious lives as part of an ethnic Vietnamese nation. And these co-ethnics really considered themselves to be a nation divided by borders, but the undoing of physical borders did not similarly undo social borders. So in the book, I argue that this is because border crossings have preserved everyday Vietnamese people's sense of ethnic nationhood while working to undo their commitment to ethnic nationalism. So by border crossings, I mean both borders crossing over people through state formation and people crossing over borders through international migration. By nationhood, I'm interested here in people's subjectively felt sense of belonging that relies on common descent, distinction in relation to other nations and claims of social solidarity. 
And by nationalism, I mean the principle that the political and cultural units here at the state and the nation should be congruent. And I hope to demonstrate over the next few slides how nationhood and nationalism might change in contradictory ways after border crossings. So like the Deutsche Welle piece that you saw, or as was also true in the Deutsche Welle piece that you saw briefly, observers assumed that Vietnamese refugees were people from South Vietnam who were anti-communist and loyal to the yellow flag with three red stripes. They also assumed that contract workers were people from North Vietnam who were pro-communist and loyal to the red flag with a yellow star. But as you heard in the trailer, Dai's family is originally from the North as were nearly 1 million others who headed southward in 1954 and eventually left again after the reunification of Vietnam in 1975. I also met Northerners whose families had been persecuted by the communist government, but who later went abroad as economic migrants. And because the contract worker program began after Vietnam reunified, there were people from across regions who ended up going abroad as economic migrants. So I wanna emphasize here that this migrant refugee binary, as Rebecca Hamlin calls it, really fails to capture the diverse motivations and opportunities with which people cross international borders. Nevertheless, the Vietnamese border crossers themselves often reproduced these assumptions, these mappings, even when they knew better. So for the rest of the talk, it's really going to follow more of the spirit of the book, which is an exercise in analytically informed storytelling. So I'm concerned primarily with conveying scenes of everyday life. And these data were drawn from ethnographic observation at two cultural organizations where I met Thai and Jin, both of whom you heard a bit about in the trailer. And I also volunteered at three Buddhist pagodas, one of which I'll say more about shortly. But I just wanna note now that I also conducted interviews and I can talk more about methods in the Q&A. Okay, so to go back to Thai and Jin, who you were introduced to in the trailer, I first met them through two cultural organizations, one that I call Refugees for Germany, and the other that I call Friendship and Adventure, so RFG and FAA. The organizations had starkly contrasting memberships. RFG was largely refugees and or Southerners. These two categories did not always map. While FAA was predominantly Northerners and former contract workers, with some important exceptions I'll talk about in a couple of slides. At RFG, Thai doesn't talk to me the first day that I visit, and instead the uncle who invites me to the gathering just ushers me into the kitchen to talk with the aunts, and it's only two weeks later that I finally speak to Thai, and at this point he starts to ask about my upbringing in the U.S., revealing that he's already been asking a little bit about me before being willing to talk to me. Jin didn't say too much the first time I met her, the same month as when I met Thai, but it's not because she's trying to figure out my background. It's because we're at a holiday party and she's busy eating and chatting with other members of FAA. And then some folks make an announcement, they're introducing me as a student who's visiting and they're encouraging the aunts and uncles who are there to help me with my studies. And so at this point, I'm sitting at this long table across from Jin and her husband, Mia, and we start exchanging greetings in Vietnamese, and they hear my Southern accent, and Mia remarks that Saigon girls speak so sweetly. So they agree right then and there to help me with my research, and I think I actually interviewed them for the first time just a few days after that. So you can already gauge from these introductions that a lot of the hesitation the policing even of social networks comes from RFG rather than from FAA. And the latter organization is really open to anyone who's Vietnamese and wants to socialize. Their events were also very different. So RFG tended to commemorate the nation in exile with symbols and discourses that aim to meld Saigon and Berlin together and to represent their joint allegiances to both fallen South Vietnam and Germany. FAA events were more often celebrations of an ostensibly reunified nation, but it was one that was cast in the image of the former North, even if that wasn't something that was obvious to the folks attending these events at that time. So at this point, I'd like to introduce you to one 
to two important interlocutors who tried and both failed actually to straddle both RFG and FAA. The first is someone I call Hun. She's an international student born and raised in Hai Phong in Northern Vietnam. And for part-time work, she's assisting in a social science research project through a local university. So she needs to distribute a survey on mental health to Vietnamese migrants from the North and the South. And she starts coming with me to events at RFG and FAA to try to get respondents. So she first meets Southerners at a cultural event celebrating the Lunar New Year hosted by the Vietnamese refugee community of Berlin, which is this first line here that you see in blue. I arrive at the event just after 6 p.m. from a meeting with RFG and I find Hatton. She's been waiting by herself in the auditorium where performances are soon gonna start taking place. She's not really talking to anyone. And then the performances start and children as young as four years old are starting to perform these so-called yellow songs that evoke life in South Vietnam before 1975. And then midway through one of the performances as Hutton is shifting uneasily, she points to the sign above the stage which reads Vietnam Freedom Spring. And it's etched onto the pattern of the yellow striped flag of former South Vietnam. So up until this point, I've been participating in some of the singing of Southern songs. I've been just appreciating the choreographed performances and practices and all of these things that for me encompassed a sense of national unity. But these very same signs signaled to Hutton national division. And her reaction also reveals a discrepancy between how border crossers experienced the red and yellow flags. So because South Vietnam no longer exists, it's harder for the yellow flag to become banal or apolitical in the same way that the red flag is for Hutton. So we leave a couple of hours later, we walk to the light rail station together and Hunt confides that she felt really disconnected in this, in this Southern setting. People kept their distance and didn't wanna to get to know her. And I can't really assuage her feeling that Southerners were putting a distance between themselves and her. So this comes up time and again when I introduce Hutton to people, especially to folks in RFG, including one uncle called Hua, who I'll say more about on the next slide. But the first time that he meets her and she's sitting with me and I introduce them, he makes a point of inviting me to a protest against communism. And he adds, but I wanna make sure to clarify because Hutton, you're a northerner, I'm against the regime, not individual. And it was his attempt to make her feel better. But despite this, what he was also doing is associating Hutton as a northerner with the state of Vietnam and me and him as southerners as outside of it. Just to wrap up about Hutton, by the time that I left Berlin in late August of 2016, she had still been stonewalled from distributing her survey to RFG. Meanwhile, I had been voice recording them about really intimate details of their lives. And this point is gonna come up in a little bit, but I also now wanna introduce the second interlocutor, Anne, who tried earnestly to be part of RFG and FAA. She's from the Mekong Delta of Southern Vietnam. And when we first met, she had been participating in both cultural organizations, mostly because she's really outgoing and likes to make friends. She's also a fervent anti-communist. She posts about the failures of the Vietnamese state on social media, and then she makes sure to tag folks from FAA as well. But her politics didn't seem to harm these friendships because many of those folks were also critical of the Vietnamese government. So this is late 2015, early 2016. And by late spring, Anne's relationship with RFG has started to fray really badly. So even though she introduced me to them a few months earlier, she no longer attends. She's no longer invited really to their events. And the aunts and uncles who are there talk in whispers and hints about her suspicious allegiances that she befriends people too easily. And this comes to a head one afternoon when I interview Kwa, who I mentioned from the last slide at his one bedroom apartment, which he furnishes with a mantle that is paying homage to leading South Vietnamese political and military figures who committed suicide on the day that Saigon fell instead of cooperating with Northern forces. Military insignia hang all over his home and he's able to produce the military garb that he wore when he was serving as well. 
So we talk for a while and then after we're done and I turn off the voice recorder, he asks what I'm doing for the rest of the day. And I say, oh, I'm gonna go visit and at her workplace. I don't invite him, but he says he's going to come with me because he's friends with Anne's boss, but he proceeds to berate me and tells me I'm a bad judge of character because Anne isn't someone I should spend time with. So we take the subway together. We show up to the restaurant where Anne works and Hua is really frosty to her. She doesn't seem to take notice, but she's an outspoken anti-communist. So why should she think that he considers her politically compromised? And then a few minutes later, the husband of the restaurant owner comes by. I call him Laup, and I think he's about the same age as Hua. And because they're both just sitting there hanging out, I suggest that, hey, you're, you're just sitting there. You should fill out this brief survey. So she hands each of them a copy of the questionnaire that Hatton is passing out for part-time work. And Laup starts to flip through the survey, and he immediately says this was sent by communists. So he and Hua cite as their evidence that the survey asked for a bunch of demographic information, their names, dates of birth, address, and questions about their religion and other things that they find just super intrusive. So I, I try to interject a couple of times to say, researchers often offer an honorarium to participants. They need to show that funding sources they need to show two funding sources that real people filled out these forms, but Laup is responding aggressively that only communists would ask these questions. So Anne and I are exchanging worried looks. We're trying to de-escalate, and I tell Hua, because I know him much better, Uncle, I've asked you similar questions. And then he says, yeah, but you don't ask people to write down their answers. Two hours before this, I did, however, voice record him and take photos of his home with his permission. But again, I'm trying to de-escalate, so I don't say this. So Laup and Hua keep egging each other on. They're chugging beers. They're chewing on snacks for the next hour. They change topics. They're starting to get louder. And then they abruptly come back to the survey, and they start complaining about it again. And they're spitting out these chunks of roasted peanut that they've been chewing on. And then Hua says belligerently that, that's it. I'm going to complain to RFG about Hutton. And I'm really trying to calm him down. And I say, uncle, I know Hutton. She really is just a student. I ask you many of the same questions. And at this point, he snaps that I can ask him anything because I'm because my father was an imprisoned Southern officer. But if I had been from Vietnam, and here I think he also means if I had been a Northerner and asking him these questions, he would have strangled me. So I'm shaken and I look at Anne and she scoffs. She's not taking him very seriously, but his composure indicates to me complete seriousness. And I recount this experience to really say that the policing of social networks was one important way that the healing that Lan longed for could not be actualized. And I also wanna make a point to say that Kwa actually spends a lot of time mobilizing resources to send to disabled veterans in Vietnam. So I asked him, what motivates you to do that? And he said, well, this is to help my ethnic kin, my countrymen. Yet the way that he gatekeeps access to RFG also shows that Hun and Northerners fall outside of this. So these are some of the ways that this was happening in RFG and FAA, but this was largely happening in isolation from each other, save for, again, the two people, Anne and Hutton, who were trying to straddle both organizations. So I looked for an institution where Northerners and Southerners, contract workers and refugees, RFG members and FAA members would gather together. And this led me to Lintu Buddhist Pagoda in Western Berlin, which was founded by refugees and folks who came to West Berlin through family reunification for refugees. So when the, when the wall fell, it was one of the main efforts by Vietnamese in the West to support those fleeing from the East. And people who were around during that time recalled going out to the streets of Berlin in the winter, looking for contract worker co-ethnics to bring them home, give them clothing, shelter, translate for them, go into asylum camps to help. By the way, contract workers also told me that they experienced these visits in their camps. But these relationships soon soured. So people cited things such as accent, certain turns of phrase, and ways of practicing religion as things that really set off this north-south divide. And the physical division of this space was really clear from my first day at Lin Pu when I entered the kitchen that's on the side of this photo you see here on the ground floor. 
and there are two northern disciples cleaning upstairs or sorry on the ground floor then they send me downstairs where a group of southerners are in the basement helping the resident nuns prepare some desserts for an upcoming festival and they're singing southern songs they're making jokes about whether girls from Mita or Saigon both in the south are prettier so by the time that I left field work in 2016 there were actually more northerners who attended the pagoda than did southerners and there were former contract workers in particular who had contributed vast sums of money to help build this ornate elaborate pagoda but the southern claims to ownership over this space still persisted and this was abundantly clear during the penultimate lunar new year's event which is a holiday that revolves around family so on this day vietnamese households typically prepare feasts to so that the spirits of deceased ancestors can descend to share a meal with loved ones and some of their offerings i don't know how clearly you can see them in the photo but there are these plates of fruit there are also candies that have been laid out on the prayer hall and then just behind that, it's these nuns who are sitting in the front, flanked by all of these lay disciples, and they're taking turns reading off a list of names of deceased family members that have been relayed to them by disciples who have also made it an, a monetary donation to the pagoda. Downstairs, other volunteers have arranged the dining hall into these tight rows of circular tables that are set out with vegetables, pastries, and a hot pot for cooking broth. And to the right of the stage in front, I hope you can see here, the photo is a little blurry, but there are these yellow apricot blossoms that are commonly found in Southern Vietnam, branching out from this festive vase. And soon some karaoke singers start to take turns on the stage as the lay disciples upstairs head down to start to eat. And in between live performances, pre-recorded music starts to play in the background. I hope you can hear that, but not too loudly. And the song goes, I often think of home in the afternoons, especially rainy afternoons. Luckily, California rains seldom, unlike Saigon. Otherwise, I'd have cried a river. So these lyrics recall the loss of South Vietnam with its capital in Saigon. And reinforcing this exile status is the reference to California, the state with the largest concentration of Vietnamese outside of Vietnam. I want to emphasize again here that this music is incredibly melancholic. I hope you were able to just catch a little bit of it. And this is rather jarring considering the festive setting and that we're all sitting down to start getting ready to eat. So there's a woman who's not in this picture. She's sitting two seats to my right. So I just cropped her out and I call her Helm. She's from Southern Vietnam. And she takes this time to point to me that all of the songs are from the South, implying to whom the pagoda belongs. Both before and after this event, Helm had told me in no uncertain terms that she doesn't discriminate against our Vietnamese brothers and sisters, whether they're from the North or the South. But she also took a lot of opportunities to mock what she perceived as their utter lack of proper etiquette in this religious space. So she claimed that Buddhism had given her the tools to not resent Northerners, but she still felt that it was important to point out that the pagoda belonged to Southerners and that they had a truer, that we, had a truer relationship to Buddhism. So Vietnamese folks such as Hom pulled these secular hostilities into a sacred space that they saw as prioritizing harmony. And in doing so, these folks who are co-ethnics and co-religionists show how different arenas of social life become absorbed into national divisions after border crossings. So the vignettes that I've shared have focused on how people rebuild their lives after surviving war, migrating internationally, and experiencing states rise and fall. For my interlocutors, the idea of the nation really powerfully shaped how they understood their opportunities at work, which was a chapter I didn't share about in this talk, how they initiate and maintain friendships, and how they practice religion. We can glean this also in how decades after the end of the Cold War, these identity labels of Northerner and Southerner, contract worker and refugee and communist and anti-communist still endure. And they continue to inform how Vietnamese border crossers in Berlin interact with one another, even as they recognize that these don't map well onto one another. I wanna re return here to Lan's question. So why haven't Vietnamese border crossers been able to heal with co-ethnics? And in part, my answer is that 
through their routine words and actions, people are keeping these boundaries alive, including some of the same people, many of the same people actually, who express regret that these boundaries persist. So even though social scientists know that a sense of nationhood based on ethnicity isn't important to everyone all the time, it did matter a lot to the protagonist of my book much of the time. And so resoundingly, the Vietnamese subjects of this book reject the political principle of one nation, one state. And this is especially ironic given that they've fulfilled the division of the homeland decades after its reunification outside of its territory in a way that I suspect folks who are still in Vietnam aren't able to do. So I'll end here with just a final note that this book really tries to affirm that borders and border crossings continue to matter deeply for people's everyday lives. And I'm looking forward to Irene's comments and to questions and just sharing with the rest of the audience. Okay, terrific. Thank you so much, uh, Fee. So we'll turn the floor over now to uh, Irene Blomrad for a comment. All right. Um, well, thanks, uh, Roger, for inviting me to do this. And thanks so much, Fee, for, for sending the book and um, letting me be your discussant. Um, I have to say that when I um, received the invitation and I read that this was a book about two, largely about two streams of migration to Berlin and uh, the division between East and West Berlin before the wall fell, I had this moment where I thought to myself, um, I wonder if I need to explain to my audience a little bit more, or at least to the younger people in my audience, um, things such as what the Cold War did and, and how people felt during the Cold War. And then now we have two weeks of Russian invasion in Ukraine and, and it's not quite the same, but oh my gosh, I'm getting flashbacks from, from the 1970s and 80s. Um, so it, it sort of renews the importance um, of some of these themes. And I, I would actually be very interested to know what's going on in the Vietnamese community in Berlin, maybe even today um, around some of these things. So I think Fee gave an absolutely uh, wonderful overview of the book. And I really, I, I was mentioning to her this to her before that I really enjoyed the, the short video and I wish more of us did this. Um, some of the, the things that I really appreciated was this fascinating comparison between um, the contract workers who left uh, Vietnam um, who are seen as Northerners, even though they might have come from Central Vietnam or from, from other areas, but they leave Vietnam in, you know, 79, 80, these, throughout the 80s until the Berlin, fall, the, the Berlin Wall fell, um, as contract workers to West Germany. And this is part of what Fee notes in, in a, a very short sort of appendix or, or addendum to the book, um, speaks to literatures on socialist mobilities. Uh, and, and she notes that the book is not primarily about socialist mobility. She's framed it around nationalism and nationhood. Um, but I want to at least say for everybody who has not had a chance to read the book, um, and mostly I would say to my American sociologist colleagues, um, I would encourage you to pick this book up for the light it shines on socialist mobilities, because I think it's very rare in sociology of migration. Um, I think historians are doing more interesting work here. Um, and it's also very rare because it's in English. Now, of course, this is because the socialist countries to which uh, the socialist migration was happening were not generally English speaking countries. And so I have a feeling that us, those of us who read largely in English, we're missing out on this whole stream of migration and the importance of it to understanding migration politics and nation. Um, so I just, I really enjoyed the comparison between a story that I think is more common in the West or in, in English speaking sociology of migration, which is about refugees, refugees leaving Southeast Asia, refugees arriving in countries such as the United States, Germany, Australia, Canada, being given relatively warm welcomes within a Cold War context. And then that, that's the kind of narratives we get. And what we get in this book is we get a, a portrayal of people who are also leaving difficult situations in North, or sorry, in Vietnam, 
um, but then are now being associated with a regime and a politics and an ideology, even though their migration might have been largely and overwhelmingly economic. Um, maybe they also had suffered under the regime in various ways, but because of the nature and the moment of their migration and especially sort of the sponsoring state and where they went to, so both the, the conditions of exit as Fee says in her book and the context of reception when they arrive, they are given this label. And, and it, I find it super interesting because I do think that in a lot of current migration studies, we talk a lot about labels, legal and documented, maybe uh, refugee and non-refugee. And she's hinting at, and at, at various points pointing out that those labels, the contract worker and refugee isn't just a legal status, but it is, it is about an entire sort of stream of migration and sort of what is overlaid in terms of political ideology uh, and, and how you're even typified because you were sometimes by accident put in one of those streams. So an encouragement to everybody to, to look at the book, to read the book, um, to see this comparison of people leaving Vietnam at roughly the same time, late 70s, throughout the 80s, and then arriving in Berlin, being separated by the wall, being separated by the way that they left, either as refugees, often boat people, or as contract workers. Um, but, you know, as she points out in, in the conversation or the discussion of the book that she just gave, it's not that simple because the book also contains stories of marriage migrants who do not fall into the refugee or the contract worker uh, dichotomy and then international students um, like she mentioned, but they get maybe trapped or at least have to be slotted in to these kind of dichotomies. Um, I would also commend Fee because I think this was a, this is a very courageous book. Um, as someone who has interviewed uh, Vietnamese migrants in North America, um, I know that the internal politics of the Vietnamese community can be very fraught. Um, I appreciated how empathetic and situated Fee's discussion of all of the border crossers that she interviewed was. Um, she is trying to reflect the um, the complications of their lives, the complications of the politics they find themselves in. Um, and it's not necessarily easy, I think, to give that nuanced and broad view of Vietnamese migration. Um, and so I thought this was an extremely courageous and a very human book. It was, it was a very empathetic um, and understanding way of talking about the community. And then, um, as, as you probably just got a hint of from, from the short comments um, that she provided, it, there are absolutely intriguing descriptions of this policing that happens in different ways and different forms, be it through the use of music, be it through who's allowed or should be friends with whom, uh, the things that people say. Um, so I, I really enjoyed um, and learned a lot from that careful sort of ethnographic attention to words, actions, um, processes, and the fact that the ethnography was done across so many areas of life. So uh, if he was able to get uh, and see little slices of family life, having dinner with people, being in their apartments, attending the public cultural events that she mentioned, attending conferences that were about human, um, human services or social work, um, engaging with the temples. Um, and then she also, and she didn't really speak about this, but she did 81 interviews and then really uh, centered the book around 18 key respondents who, who are sort of primarily featured in the book. Um, and, you know, as she said, and I'm going to quote here from the book, the book examines how they, the, the, the border crossers, uh, talk, choose, perform, and consume the nation in their homes, at their workplaces, and during cultural or religious fest festivities. Um, and I also want to underscore something else that she said is her, her, her analytical approach. Um, at some point, she says it's less theory, more description. And the book is an exercise in analytically informed storytelling. So I'm going to raise 
sort of three points to, to advance our conversation. Um, first is gonna be something or one about um, theory, uh, one or concepts perhaps. A second is about um, context and the way that context might amplify or provide resonance um, for some of the, the phenomena that she identifies. And the third is an open question that she can take or leave um, around gender as an ethnographer. And gender is a second theme that Fee mentions as, you know, she's thought about a lot, but it's not gonna be in the book because the book is centrally focused on, on nationhood and um, nationalism. Um, but it just kept coming up for me as I was reading through the book, just gender was sort of in the background on a lot of this. So I, I, and like I said, you, you can just ignore my question, but I was curious. Um, so let me start with the first one. Um, in the concepts, sort of key guiding concepts that um, is uh, animating um, the book, there's a, a definition of nationhood and I'm going to read out that definition. It's very short. I mean people's subjective sense of belonging and then um, elaborated a little bit more, a sense of social solidarity, a sense of common descent, distinctions from other nations. And then in contrast, nationalism is, and here I quote, the political principle that each nation should have its own state. Um, and then she says, uh, but as the following chapters delve into the Vietnamese subjects I spent time with in Berlin, by and large have abandoned this ethno-nationalist project, even as they um, see their fellow Vietnamese as he said, brothers and sisters or as compatriots. So this sense of community in one sense, but not a, an ethno-nationalist project. Um, and I think that I might have articulated what I, I think I might've articulated the, the, the findings slightly differently. Um, and so I'm just gonna try out some, some alternative ways of framing this. Um, and I'd love your reaction, Pete. Um, I wonder if, there, if you couldn't have talked a little bit more about notions of um, nation in, in, ver in very much an old fashioned sense of a uh, civic or political nation versus ethnic or ancestry based nation. And the, the co-constituate, like how culture might be co-constituted both by ethnicity and culture and or politics and the way those things get intertwined. And I have to say that at some points I got a little bit lost about nationhood versus nationalism. And I, and I, wasn't, I wasn't entirely sure all the time how those two things were in play. And part of what I kept thinking is, is this really an issue of status? And I mean Weberian status, like who, who gets to be hierarchically on top and who is, is below. Um, and clearly there's all this kind of status negotiation going on within the community and then also among people in the community vis-a-vis -vis German society. Um, and, and so I, I would have, I, I would love to know a little bit more about why you decided to use borders and nation and nationhood rather than maybe alternative language around civic political nationalism versus ethnic ancestry-based nationalism, why you might not have leaned a little bit more on the cultural sociology concepts of boundaries. I'm thinking here of Michelle Lamont or even Andreas Wimmer. Um, I mean, I know you cite them, but I, I think there might've been a little bit more that could have been done there. And I think about this in respect to how in another chapter, which he did not have a chance to, to, to discuss with everybody, she notes that when, after the Berlin Wall falls, um, people in the East are in a very precarious situation. They lose, many of them will lose their uh, jobs. Um, so the contracts are all gone, East Germany no longer exists and they find themselves in legal limbo. They, they, it's not clear what their legal status is going to be. And because of the legal precarity and the economic precarity, some proportion of the community starts um, 
participating in uh, criminal activities, illegal activities, selling, if I understood correctly, cigarettes. And I don't know if part of me is like, wow, cigarettes, is that really so horrible? But yes, selling cigarettes. And so they get associated with criminality. But then there's these moments of ethnographic observation, which is really interesting, where people um, don't seem to associate it with northern cultural traits and I'd like to hear a little bit more about that so it's not that they're from a particular village or they're from Hanoi or they're from um, you know a particular way of doing Buddhism and therefore they are criminal it's because they were under a communist regime or they they lived under the authoritarian communist regime and so of course they have not imbued the right liberal values or the right respect for law, et cetera, et cetera. And so the, 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 the undeservingness of these people is actually not linked to cultural traits, it's linked to political traits. But there's another moment where if he goes into somebody's home and um, there, the, the woman in the home has very diff has difficult has a difficult life situation. Um, her her second husband um, is also in a difficult situation because he is he does not have legal status. He is working really hard, et cetera, et cetera. But there there's clearly um, some problems in the relationship, and the the woman puts it down to sort of bad gender values. The, at least that's how I read it. And so her partner just does not have the right German gender values, um, you know, is not taking care of the kids sufficiently, et cetera, et cetera. And I wasn't as certain, so this was about a Northern, Northerners. I wasn't as certain, does that mean then that the Southern Vietnamese are all seen as gender enlightened and, and culturally enlightened? Like, is it the case that because they're from the South and they've gone to Germany and they have drank the German democratic values, that those gender relations are now all positive. And it, it almost felt like it, but I wasn't quite sure if that's where it was going. So the general comment would be, I would have loved to know a little bit more about how politics and notions of culture reinforce or are used in different ways around some of these issues. Second point is then related to what I was just uh, thinking about, like the, 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 the amplification that is done between the, the internal dynamics between North and South Vietnamese, and then the dynamics with the host society, namely Germany, both pre and post the fall of the Berlin Wall. And there's one chapter that I think does this wonderful job of noting many of the structural issues that the migrants are facing in terms of their legal status, the way they can access work. Um, and there's also some mention, but it, it drops out later on about racism. And I, and so after the fall of the wall, if I, so let me, let me take a step back. If I understood the argument correctly in the book, pre, when, when Berlin was still divided, Western, uh, Berliners and West Germans were largely positive about the Vietna Vietnamese. They, they were in favor of the refugees. They saw them as trying to integrate. They were provided with language services. They were dispersed, so they didn't have much of an ethnic community, but they were seen as hardworking and positive. East Berlin and East Germany also seemed to have a pretty positive view on the Vietnamese. They're isolated from the Vietnamese, but they're seen as hard workers. There are fellow socialists you know, international workers, and we're, you know, we're all part of the international socialist community, um, but they're seen as, as being particularly hard workers. And so we have these very positive views, as you portray it, pre-1989, and then suddenly post-1989, we have racist acts, we have fire bombings, we have one of the, the Vietnamese interlocutors who's even asked to go and beat up and other Vietnamese, which is just crazy. Um, and so I was, I was wondering more about how and whether some of the reactions you see within the community is also reacting to German society. And again, this question of status in my, in my mind. And, and you know, I think a more general tendency among many immigrant communities 
that the ones who feel more established and settled want to continue to be seen as the good immigrants and that the newer people are seen as the bad immigrants. So I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more how you're thinking about the amplification or the resonance of the internal community dynamics with the broader um, host community politics. Um, and we could even extend that. I mean, so you, you make a, a reference in passing that it's not just about Vietnamese in Germany, but there's a larger Vietnamese diaspora. And then as you showed with the song that you shared, you know, the California Vietnamese community is very dominant, let's say, in, in, in sort of perpetuating a particular very strong anti-communist message. And so I would also be interested in how this all plays into geopolitics more generally. All right, last question, and it'll be very brief. I'd love to hear more about gender in general, analytically, um, but also your experience as an ethnographer, if you're willing to share, especially with younger scholars who are doing this work, um, because among the things that struck me is that both of your stories about your initial entrance into these communities, and you mentioned one of them today, seemed highly gendered. So the fact that, you know, Southern girls speak very sweetly. Um, and then there was another instance too, where you were sort of tested in terms of whether you could be trusted. And it was again, in a very gender, at least I read it as a very gendered language. Um, and I, I was wondering, you know, what that experience was like, um, what kind of, um, yeah, what kind of choices you had to make as an ethnographer in terms of challenging, accepting, um, dealing with that, how that might have affected the analysis. Um, but as I said, you, you don't have to talk about it and maybe we can get together to ASA and you can chat with me then. Okay, terrific. Thank you so much. You've given Fee a lot of food for thought. Okay, Fee, do you want to respond relatively briefly so that we can open it up for discussion with the very large audience that has come out for this talk? Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks, Roger, and thank you, Irene, for these. I, gosh, I wish we had more time to talk about them, but yes, following up would be fantastic. Why don't I try to at least say a little bit about each of your questions in reverse order, and I'll take advantage of the fact that my sister is on the call and was with me in this first summer when we were in Berlin and I was trying to find respondents, and we were stopped in broad daylight in Lichtenberg which is where a lot of former contract workers moved to after, and a lot of Northerners actually still live around today. And so the question about gender pervading this was definitely, after that, I went back to Ruben and Roger and said, I, I don't know if I wanna do this or I don't know if I can do this anymore. And I think it's important to say that, right? In field work, a lot of things come up and this was true for everyone at UCLA, visas being canceled, epidemics breaking out, violence and things like that. And so I really did have to think about, well, if I, if I go back to this site and I ultimately decided to, how do I protect myself? But yeah, that definitely was on my mind a lot. And Fung and I <laughs> can talk to other folks about this as well, but that was, that was a really harrowing experience because it just felt like, we're in this place where even though we had both studied German in high school, we weren't fluent enough to be like, hey, this is what's happening, help, at the time. And then a lot of the interactions with respondents often reminded me of what the expectations were that I should abide by, right? So some would berate me about, why don't you have children? And what does your husband do? And things like that. So they definitely all came up in the field site and also just in the context of thinking about how nationalism is a very masculinist enterprise, right? And that the folks who are revered, the soldiers, the heroes, the political leaders are men. And it's very much a story being told about folks who are masculine in the center. I bring up Feng Su also to just say that if you'd like to hear from a Sioux sociologist who works on gender, you can, <laughs> you can head her way. So I will then go to your second question, which is asking, I think about my notes are really sloppy, but the dynamics with the host society pre and post Berlin, also kind of this seeming disconnect between, they feel like they're very appreciated before the fall of the Berlin Wall, and then that changes after the fall of the Berlin Wall. So why that kind of abrupt break and how does that shape 
kind of the ways that they relate to status. So yeah, that's a great point. And I want to differentiate here between the ways that folks were living in these ethnic and gender segregated dorms and only really encountering natives in the context of very tightly curated workspaces and getting messages from those workspaces about how they were these disciplined, thrifty, hardworking folks who were part of this socialist cause versus then afterwards hearing folks talk about, I felt really happy back then. I thought it was like a paradise, but then the Berlin Wall came down and there was all this racism. Well, that racism didn't come from nowhere, right? As you were pointing out, but their sense was that the government had protected them from those elements. And that because East Germany fell, then the reunified country was no longer doing such a good job of protecting them. I also see some folks on this call who do work on East Germany and, and socialist exchanges. And I think they also talk about the riots, the burnings that happened in Rostock Lichtenhagen, right? And so it was jarring for these folks because previously they had received this image that you are appreciated. We are standing together in social solidarity. We're rebuilding our homelands together and then to be exposed to everything else. But certainly I agree that that was there beforehand. And the status question comes up too with, I talk about these two folks who were, one was a refugee and the other was, came through family reunification for refugees and they were living in the West at the time, but they made sure to go out and try to provide support. They interrupted their studies to just do this full time and try to provide resources for contract workers. But then they started being told, you know, all of these Vietnamese are causing trouble and things like that. And to their mind, it was lumping all of them together. So they didn't have a sense that Germans were differentiating necessarily between, oh, these are the good citizens and these are the folks who are causing trouble. So I think if status played a role and I'm, I'm sure that it did in some way, it was something that they weren't focusing on as they were articulating how important it was just to communicate to people that these co-ethnics need help at this moment. And if they're doing things that are running afoul of the law, it's because of the socialist context in which they grew up. It's because of the socialist context in which they're fleeing right now. I think that's a good place to jump to the big question. And I wrote down a couple of different versions of the question. So hopefully I can get to some of them. So could I have talked more about the notion of nations in an old fashioned sense? So civic or ethnic or thinking about culture and how it's co-constituted. So I don't recognize my own writing anymore, but <laughs> just, just why, why this focus on nationhood and nationalism versus boundaries or civic or political nationalism or civic or political belonging. And I'll throw in a couple of other ones that I, other hats that I tried on too. So why not transnationalism? Why not diaspora? And I do think that there are threads for all of these things in this case. But it seemed to me specific to thinking about, well, isn't this just about citizenship or isn't this just about status? On an individual level, there were former contract workers who had acquired citizenship. There were former contract workers who had studied in the GDR, returned as contract worker leads for these labor contingents, spoke fluent German, acquired citizenship and conferred it to their children, but that didn't bridge the divide. So at the individual level, I don't think that status differentiation between Vietnamese folks who are conceived as good German citizens who speak the language, understand the kind of cultural repertoires of here's how I navigate myself in this kind of society that didn't seem to bridge them and neither did politics. So a lot of folks again were very supportive of the Socialist Democratic Party of, of Germany, but they they were so or could be so because they differentiated it from a one party socialist system. And then to the question of, yeah, culture was a thread that I pulled through, I think all of the chapters, especially in thinking about how this Northern couple you mentioned talk about the cultural poverty that they really associate with belonging to the state of Vietnam. But even though culture wove through that, politics wove through that, so that wife actually said, we would be much better off if the South had won the war instead of the North, even though she's a Northerner, right? But for me, the thing that was consistent 
even if in this instance, culture was missing or specific politics was missing or something about ethnicity was missing, was this idea that we now fall outside of the state. But that with the same refrain of, I'm gonna invite you into my home. I don't know you, but I'm gonna tell you all of these things about my life and potentially really scary things for my undocumented husband who is still a Vietnamese citizen because you are a member of my ethnic nation and I can share that with you, but you're also better than me because you're, you don't belong to this state anymore and neither should you. And so it was this recurring idea of we are one people, but we just don't have to belong to the same country. And, and very few people, I think two exceptions in the book are hoping that the regime will change, but for the most part, they're just like, well, we're one people, but we don't have to belong to the same country. And actually this country only represents a certain group of us. So thanks so much. Okay, terrific, thank you. So now we'll segue to the discussion part of the, of the session. And so you could, the easiest for me would be if you uh, raise the user raise hand function or send me a question in the chat. Don't see anyone yet. I'd also be happy to talk about, Irene and I were talking earlier about making a book trailer. So if folks are interested, I'd love to share about that because I think it Okay, was, sure, it was really go fun. ahead, right. Oh, right away, okay. <laughs> sure. so, we're waiting, yeah, no comment. So go ahead, yeah. Sure, yeah. So I was telling Irene, I made, I wrote the script for this. It was exactly a hundred words because the animation studio that NYU would w, which was my home institution at the time, generously offered to, to pay for. They said, people, you lose their attention very quickly. So cut it down to 100 words. That is exactly one minute of speaking slowly. And it was just a really fun way to think about how to talk about this work to an audience that's not just sociologists or academics, right? So right before this, Amanda Chiang, who's on the call, was kind enough to speak to my class paper trails about the book manuscript that she's working on. And one of the questions that she got was, who was your intended audience? And I think that is a question that I struggled with because in part, the audience obviously for university press is academics, but I also really wanted this to be accessible and not just accessible, but I wanted this to be fair and I wanted the folks who participated in this study, who shared their lives with me and who can read English to be able to read this and feel like it was a just representation of the time that we spent together. And I think that it was really fun to be able to try to do that in a short one minute piece that just brought together all of these things. Okay, terrific. Uh, we have a question from Hiroshi Mutamura. Hiroshi? Hi. Uh Thanks, and, and I'm really looking forward to reading the book, which I, I have not done. And I apologize if I ask you about something that I missed because I had to come on late after finishing a class, but could you say more about the generational elements here, the generational dimension? I mean, you just mentioned it a second ago in relation to the children and speaking German, but 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 that's clearly um, raises questions of, of what's happening in the second, third generation here. So I just wanted to ask you to talk more about that and and, and, and whether, what you see in the parents whom you interview continues. And if it doesn't continue, or, or if it does continue, what are the ways in parts of their lives that, that the continuation occurs or doesn't occur? Yeah, thanks so much for that, Hiroshi. So I actually didn't say very much about that in the talk at all, but I focused on border crossers. So I focused primarily on folks who are first generation, but they were first generation across several decades. So there were first folks who were first generation who had left in the 70s. There were also folks who were first generation international students who left just and had just arrived in Berlin right before I got there. And it was their first time being abroad and they were 19 years old. So that's one aspect of this generational question. Another aspect is I did talk to some folks who were second generation. They weren't the focus of the book, but I just met them in a lot of spaces and it was important for me to talk to them. But as Irene had mentioned, I think in the, in the overview, 
what I saw was that folks would say things to the effect of there was a child of refugees, for example, who said, growing up, I was told that if I encountered someone from the North, they would try to kill me. So until I went to college, I truly believed if I ever encountered someone, they would try to kill me. And it wasn't until college that then there would be these opportunities for them to try to connect. So I connected with a lot of folks at the Humboldt, at the Fire University, folks who were very keen to try to spend time together around shared vietnamese -ness. But then things would come up and some of those things would be like, if they were speaking German, it was fine. But then if they switched to Vietnamese, folks would be like, oh, you're Northern. And that means you're Eastern German. And I didn't realize that folks there spoke such good German. So it's this way of kind of inflecting this Vietnamese hierarchy and mapping it onto the hierarchy of West Germans versus East Germans. That's another way I wanna to respond to your question. And the last way is just to say that one of the folks I spent the most time with was actually someone who was 19 years old, had just moved from Vietnam for the first time, was from the central region. But there's a particular, there are, the central region accent is not one that everyone would understand necessarily. And so she trained herself to speak with a Southern accent. And in these spaces, she came with me to FAA, RFG, the Pagoda as well. She was read as a Southerner. And by the end of her time there, she said to me, you know, I didn't even know what a re-education camp was when I was growing up in Vietnam. I didn't talk about North and South, but now I understand, I understand this history. And so there's a way that even if it's not in the family intergenerational, there is a transmission that is happening that is coming to encompass these folks who were born long after the war was over, including Hatton. So yeah, thanks for that question. Just a really quick follow up and that is, what you're, is, it, is it fair to read um, the story, what you said about the switching from language, that the use of the German language has a certain function to, um, can be used to erase or to pass in some sense. I mean, I'm just trying to figure out exactly what's going on in the language switching in that context. And yeah. that assumes, of course, fluency or at least comfort in both languages. Yeah, that's a good question. I wish that I, so I didn't spend any time ethnographically with second generation folks. Like I did spend time in some groups just hanging out at barbecues but not in any of these spaces that they had talked about where they were trying to bridge folks. And in fact, part of that was that these attempts to bridge folks had come maybe a decade before I arrived and they weren't doing so well. There were also attempts by other folks to like maybe try to get together and have a sports team, like a football team, a soccer team or something like that. But then someone would say, okay, let's take a photo and let's take a photo with this flag and this flag of South Vietnam and the folks from the, North would be like, hey, we understand, and it's not like we hate this flag or anything, but it, some of us are Vietnamese citizens, some of us have families in Vietnam, so it's really hard for us to do that, and that then also became a basis. So it is German language, it is, I think, also the Vietnamese language, it's signs, it's symbols, it's music, it's food, it's the way that they practice religion, it's everything about the way that they embody a sense of belonging to Vietnam or not. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Tuan Huang. Uh, yes. Hello. Um, uh, Su, thank, thank you so much for a very fascinating, um, you know, talk. I, I, you know, I did read your article on the JVS, and it seems like this book is a, you know, big ex expansion of it, which I, I, I look forward to be reading. Um, yeah, I learned, uh, you know, I learned a lot from your article um, on the JPS a few years ago. I, you know, I have a question about um, the, the subject of, of anti-communism, but specifically on um, anti-Chinese uh, nationalism. I guess it's probably a better way to, to phrase it, right? And, you know, and, and I mean, I, I, uh, my focus, my own focus is on, on Vietnamese in the U.S., but, um, uh, you know, January 6th, uh, of last year, right, prompted me to look into um, the, uh, you know, use of the former South Vietnamese flag, right, uh, in the diaspora. And certainly in the German case, um, I did find, uh, you know, a number of articles and, and uh, photos, right, about um, 
about that flag, right, at, at uh, anti-communist uh, demonstrations, but but also specifically at anti-Chinese. And I, you know, and I'm just curious, um, uh, do you find, uh, you know, um, overlaps or, you know, or, and or differences, um, right, between uh, people who identify themselves with, you know, the Republic of Vietnam, the former Republic of Vietnam, right, who would protest against uh, Chinese, right, the perception of Chinese um, uh, uh, sovereign, uh, Chinese invasion of, of, of Vietnamese sovereignty, um, right, under the former South Vietnamese flag. And then there were also Vietnamese, right, who would demonstrate against Chinese, China under the current flag of the state of Vietnam. Um, and uh, I, I mean, I can't remember the year, the exact year or, or you know, even where now, but I, I remember finding uh, a pretty interesting thing, like, you know, there were two groups of Vietnamese, right, one from, so to speak, northern and southern. Um, and, you know, the first group demonstrated at a certain, like, at a, at a particular corner, they, 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 they gather there, and then they, you know, would uh, proceed to go somewhere else. And then, like, a few hours later, another group of Vietnamese, northerners, gathered at the same, uh, at, the, at the very same corner, and they proceeded, you know, to go to another place for the demonstration. So, I mean, I, I, so it just, just, you know, it just um, uh, uh, struck my interest to be like, wow. I mean, um, is it a commonality, a potential, you know, or is it something else? Uh, I'm, I'm curious to hear your take on it. Yeah, thanks for that. If I'm, I just want to make sure I'm understanding the question correctly. So, in the context of these protests that you witnessed that were happening back to back, is anti-Chinese nationalism? A right, unifying source. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You, Thanks. You, your, your your book seems to you right uh, discuss primarily differences and explaining accounting for these differences. But when it comes to anti Chinese nationalism, is it something you know that uh, you have you found to be much overlapping? Uh, you know, area of commonality at all, or you know, or does it suggest something else? Yeah, thanks for that. I will say that in the context of this this primary fieldwork year that I spent in Germany, which is 2015 to 2016, one of the things that was at the forefront of people's minds was actually Syrian refugees and, and thinking about that and less so about Chineseness or anti-Chineseness. The other thing I would say is I did attend a couple of protests at the invitation of folks, and those were protests directed towards Vietnam. So I have photos of the yellow flag and these signs that in German, we are, um, we, we are complaining against, or what is the phrase that I'm looking for here? We're speaking out against human rights violations in Vietnam. Mm. And so that was the, the direction of the protest. I will say that one of the folks in FAA, a couple of the folks in FAA were pretty vocal about sharing on social media about mm. China and Chinese incursions on Vietnam. But it's really hard to see if that is a point of mm. unity because the mm. folks in FAA were active on social media and the folks from RFG were not. So I could only see that for, for one side of it. Yeah, but thank you for that question. Okay, uh, a question uh, that uh, David Fitzgerald sent me in the chat. Uh, what do you think is the biggest takeaway lesson of your book for refugee studies? Gosh, thank you for that, David. Yeah, let me. I'm going to answer this in two different ways. And I'm kind of of two minds about a lot of this work right now, just given the context, as Irene and I were talking about earlier, of what's happening in the world right now. So at the time that I wrote this book, I would have said that the most pressing thing to my mind about refugee studies is how is this category refugee, how is it produced, how is it created, how is it maintained to the detriment of people who are also very much experiencing political violence and other forms of violence but are not being recognized as refugees. So just doing this work to really recognize the ways that borders do violent work as Rebecca Hamlin talks about and to try to dismantle this migrant refugee binary. So that's at the time that I wrote the book. Since then, I moved across the world to Williamstown and have been involved in evacuee resettlement efforts with a fantastic group based out of First Congregational Church. And I think that then starts to shift some of my thinking to 
some of the things that many of us on this call write about, things like the importance of a co-ethnic community and co-ethnic resources, right? Where we can say, well, ethnicity, race, da da da, our social constructions, and and so on and so forth. But then when you have people in front of you who are like, I need to be around other Afghans, that becomes incredibly salient. And also just thinking about this idea that borders are doing such, such violent work and how do we meet some of those needs in the meantime. So this, this book was something that I really enjoyed doing the research for, I really enjoyed writing, but I don't think I appreciated before that even though these stories were so poignant and so emotional and lots of folks would tear up and I would tear up with them listening to these stories decades later, that that's something very different from working on something that is happening in the now. And so kudos to those folks who have been doing that. I had not previously, and it has been quite an experience to feel like, well, if you're a child of forced migrants and you study forced migrants, that means you're prepared to also host and welcome forced migrants, but they, they don't actually map all together that well. It's still an incredibly emotionally taxing experience, even with those, those different points of entry. Okay, terrific. Uh, a question from Lori Hart. Hi, I'm just going to keep my camera off because I'm having too much interference. Um, so um, this is that was a wonderful talk. I really appreciate it, um, and the work is is so interesting and compelling. I I wondered about the resonances, in fact, of the the ongoing tensions between East and West Germans in relationship to this um, tension between North and South. I mean, it, it, it's, um, they've grown up in a, um, you know, they've matured in a, in a context in which those tensions between East and West within the city have not disappeared. I mean, within the climate of Germany have certainly not disappeared and in fact have intensified. And I wonder if anyone, um, uh, well, there are two questions. One is an analytical one, one whether or not you, you, you see resonances or in some sense a fertile ground for the fomentation of these kinds of post-socialist divisions, um, uh, uh, you know, sort of in the climate. And the second one is, is more, um, did they comment at all ever on the tensions between uh, East and West, uh, formerly East and West Germans in the climate of Germany now? Yeah, thank you for your question. So the first part, do I see resonances with what's happening with East and West Germany? And yeah, one of the books that I really looked to and was thinking with in my book is by Andreas Glazer. It's called Divided in Unity. And it's making this point that after German reunification, the Berlin police force had to be reunified. And I think it might've been the only place where it was the same city police force that had to be reunified. But then you would see a lot of this distinction work that Irene was bringing up and this boundary work happening where the West German police felt like they were teaching East German, East Berlin police how to be police because of course the West one, which must mean that it knew how to handle things bureaucratically better or something like that. And so this insight that at the moment of division, that is when they are brought together in unity, that really resonated with a lot of what folks told me about the Berlin Wall comes down and then people feel like, okay, we're gonna reach out. But then after some months have passed, then it's they're finally together in this shared space, this physical space of Berlin, and they start erecting all of these boundaries. So that was really good to think of, just to think through this, I don't know if it's a paradox or this idea that when they were divided, including in Vietnam, as historians, including Olga Dror have written about, then both sides are spreading this message of national unity. We all belong to the same nation and we need to reunify with our brothers and sisters across the border. So in division, they're unified in their sense that they need to be one. But then once they're unified, they themselves are erecting these divisions. So yeah, there are definitely resonances with that. That contrast though with your second question, which is, did the Vietnamese folks connect this at all? And I think some of the younger folks, including the 1.5 and sec second generation folks might've connected it, 
But for the most part, first generation folks were more like the quote from Lan, where she was like, Germans have reunified, why haven't we? And I think that comes from a place where they're living in West Berlin and the folks who are encountering Germans in their everyday lives are mostly the folks who came as refugees and they're encountering West Germans. So I think to their mind, they're like, well, they figured it out, but they figured it out because German reunification happened through accession of the East to the West. So it's almost like the mirror image of what they're experiencing. They don't have to think about whose national narrative of Germany is it because it's the version they were already used to. So I do think there was a disconnect between what actually I think the research tells us about the relationship of Germans to each other versus how Vietnamese folks understood that. Thanks a lot, that's great. Thanks. Okay, uh, well, I don't see any other uh, questions or comments in the chat. Uh, Ruben? Yes, thank you, uh, Roger. Hi, Fee. Thank you for an excellent presentation. I just wanted to ask you, or ask you if you could um, elaborate a little bit on potential comparisons. I know you have thought about these. You know, how do, does this case compare to other cases, um, other instances where we see these processes of, you know, people moving across borders or, as a result of, you know, political cataclysms in the homeland, but then having sort of geopolitical complications making that situation even ever more complex. Thank you. Thanks, Ruben. And as folks who have read the book and the acknowledgement know, Ruben is my doctor father, the dissertation chair, and he's been with me on this journey the whole time. And this is a conversation about how do we think with other cases that we've had for many years now, thinking about Cubans and Poles and other folks who are coming from Cold War context to the US. But as Irene pointed out, when I was starting to think with these folks, there were a couple of things that I thought were really different about this case and that I really appreciated that were different about this case, which is with these different migration streams or even with Vietnamese migration to the US, it's happening across these decades and across these waves of migration. And largely, even if this is not true for every single person who left, it's in the context of this hegemonic idea of we're leaving because of communism. Another, set of comparisons that I make implicitly and that as Irene has pointed out, I talk a little bit about in the appendix is to socialist mobilities. So thinking about different folks from Cuba, from Angola, from Mozambique, who were going to these socialist countries as contract workers as well. And so these are some of the cases I was thinking with as I was writing the book. I have been dreading and have been receiving have been receiving and have been dreading questions about how this relates to what's happening in Afghanistan or what's happening right now in Ukraine, for example. And I wanna really give space to why I'm struggling with that. And I think part of it is that, as I mentioned in my response to Lori, that I didn't, or sorry, the response before that, that I didn't fully appreciate that there had been so much historical distance. And so even though some of these things are still ongoing, some of this boundary making, some of this contestation, that it still, it wasn't nearly as salient as, I don't know if I can leave this country right now. I don't know if I can escape. I don't know if I can pull my family out. And the other thing is just thinking about the context in which these border crossings were happening, these state formations were happening in Vietnam and Germany was in decades when mass decolonization efforts were happening all throughout the world. And we were used to it. There were political commentators who were feeling like this is ushering in an era of almost uninterrupted border changes. But as journalist Joshua Keating writes about in his book, we then entered a period of cartographical stasis where it was very rare for borders to move. And so the way that I think about it these days is when I'm asked, <laughs> about Ukraine and Afghanistan is that they represent such different cases because Afghanistan is this case where people might not, governments might not recognize the Taliban, but people aren't really pushing for border changes. And that fits the status quo of this cartographical stasis that we've seen for the last 40 years or so. Ukraine is different. 
And that's what makes it very terrifying. And so I'd love to just take this opportunity to say that I'm thinking about these things. I have far more questions than I do any sorts of answers or ways that this work would travel. And mostly I just hope that folks are thinking about and acting on and mourning with Ukraine and Afghanistan on their own terms. Okay, so as I don't see any other questions, I think this is a great way to end the sessions. So thanks so much for uh, to Fee for a terrific presentation and uh, to uh, Irene for uh, a very thoughtful commentary. Thanks to everyone who has joined us for today's event. And uh, I am looking forward, well, we have one, oh, okay. So I see some applause, applause in the audience, all right. So thanks to everyone for joining us and we I look forward to seeing you in our spring sessions. Okay, bye-bye everyone. And thanks again thanks, for you and Irene.